You're in New York, and it's the summer of 1983, and there's something in the air. There's a new energy in the city. As you travel through the boroughs, there's something exciting happening on the streets that you don't remember seeing before. Whether it's in the Bronx, Brooklyn, or Manhattan, groups of people are gathering around to watch some unique performers. What these performers are doing is pretty mind-blowing, and at this point, They've already been doing it for years. It's a style of dancing that will soon spread all around the world. I'm Jamie Logie, and this is Everything 80s, a podcast that looks back on a decade that forever changed the way we dress, consume, and connected. And today, we travel back to witness the birth and growth of a brand new art form that took the 80s and the world by storm. This is the history of breaking. The story of breaking is also the story of hip-hop. And to set the stage, we need to begin by traveling back to the 1970s and the birth of a new musical genre. The origins of hip-hop can probably be traced back to 1973 and a person named Clive Campbell, better known as DJ Cool Herc. DJ Cool Herc would spin records for parties in the Bronx. DJs like Herc use popular artists like James Brown as the music got people moving on the dance floor. And then Cool Herc noticed something. People at the parties responded well to the break beats in a song. The break beat or break portion of the record is where the vocals and the other instruments drop out and the focus is on the drum beat. These drum breaks or break beats may only last 5 to 10 seconds, but partygoers embrace the pure funk and rhythm. And this gave Cool Herc an idea. If you took two copies of the same record and used a crossfader on a mixer, you could move back and forth between the break beat portion of that song, extending it indefinitely and letting people enjoy it longer. And there were some records that just had the best breakbeats, like the song Apache by the Incredible Bongo Band or Funky Drummer by James Brown. Now, what used to be a short segment of a break could be two to three minutes. People flooded the dance floor when the breakbeats came on. As the parties and DJ events grew, so did demand for more of them. Since the DJ was busy on the turntables, they would often employ a master of ceremonies, or MC, to make announcements about where the next party would be, when it would occur, or how good the DJ was. Since the DJ and MC didn't want to lose the energy, they kept the records playing. But since the MC didn't want to talk over the vocals of a song, they would use the breakbeat portions to make their announcements. Those announcements set over top of a drum beat soon turned into bragging, which turned into rehearsed lines, which turned into rhyming, and the birth of a brand new art form, hip hop. But while all this was happening, so was another new movement. When the breakbeat portion of a song hit at a party, everyone hit the dance floor, as did a unique new form of dancer, a dancer who made specific use of the break portion of the song, a break dancer. Along with DJing, MCing, writing or graffiti, and knowledge, breaking makes up the five foundational pillars of hip hop. But how did dancing to a break beat evolve into the unique style and moves that make up breaking or b-boying and b-growing as its participants prefer it to be called? As we reach the end of the 70s and the 80s begin, hip-hop continues to grow. The early growth was driven by songs like Rapper's Delight by the Sugar Hill Gang. Many consider this to be one of the first, if not the very first, rap songs to be played on the radio. Hip-hop quickly spread beyond the Bronx and into the other boroughs in New York, and an underground movement of sorts began. 
One band that noticed the new movement being called hip hop was Blondie and their lead singer, Debbie Harry. The members of the band saw how unique hip hop was and even made friends with artists like Fred Brathwaite, AKA Fab Five Freddy. In 1980, Blondie released the song Rapture. Blondie was a hugely popular group with mainstream success, and this new song featured Debbie Harry doing something that many people were not familiar with yet, rapping. In Rapture, Harry raps about Fab Five Freddy telling her everything's fly, DJ spinning I said my my. She even uses a line and you don't stop sure shot. Rapture hit number one on the Billboard Hot 100 in 1981, making it, technically, the first hip hop song to top the charts. Rapture also hit number three here in Canada and number five in the UK. The video for Rapture, which featured a DJ and an artist spray painting graffiti, was also one of the first main rotations of videos when MTV first launched. Coming out of the 70s, another notable band that helped in the growth of the new art form was Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. In 1982, their song The Message achieved mainstream success. As hip-hop was growing in the 70s and into the early 80s, so were the breakers. But how did this specific style of moves and dancing come to be? And does breaking predate hip-hop? In a 2019 article in Vice, Bronx photographer Ricky Flores says that some of the breaking moves may have come out of the 1960s, where Mambo-inspired dance moves were set to rock and soul songs, with dancers rocking or up-rocking to the beats. Rocking is bending forwards at the hips, moving to the beat, while the hands can move around independently, maybe moving out to the side and back in. Up rock movements include hand gestures and jerks, which are sudden body movements. Those jerk movements can also be classified as drops, turns, and spins. In the early to mid-70s, one of those early pioneers of breaking went by the name Trixie, who was also friends with DJ Cool Herc. There was also Dancing Doug, A1 B-Boy Sasa, and Clark Kent. The aggressive style of dancing lent itself perfectly to the Bronx parties and Cool Herc's breakbeats. With the extended break portions of the song, the B-Boys would take turns dancing to the breaks. What made this style of dancing unique is that it went up and down. Punk rockers or rockers usually stayed straight up and down, jumping or thrashing around, while breaking moved downward, then up, then dropped back down before maybe starting a spin. To showcase their unique skills at a party, everyone pushed out, forming a circle to allow the B-boy or B-girl to perform in that open area called the cypher. Because it wasn't just all B-boys, as the B-girls were an important part of the pioneering days of breaking and hip-hop. Sha Rock was one of those early B-girl pioneers and an important figure in the history of hip-hop. Back in the 70s, Sha Rock began as a B-girl and traveled all around the Bronx to all the park jams, parties, and hip-hop venues to B-girl. Sha Rock then got into MCing and is considered the first female MC. In February 1981, Sha Rock even performed on an episode of Saturday Night Live with the group The Funky Four Plus One, the first rap group and first female MC to ever appear on national television. A truly iconic moment in the history of hip hop. The trailblazing MC Shah Rock was even an influence on Daryl DMC McDaniels of Run DMC. Going into the early 80s, there were also notable B-girls like Lady Rock. Something else also began to happen at those parties. Dance battles. 
But it also didn't take long for a dozen or so records to become the go-to choices for breaking, as they contained the best breakbeats. And the various records had specific moves associated with them. Besides the song Apache, which was a bongo cover of a 1960s song called Apache by The Shadows, other top choices include Give It Up by James Brown, Turn It Loose by James Brown, and T Plays It Cool by Marvin Gaye. And that brings up the age-old question. Does the B in B-boy or B-girl really stand for break? Or is it for Bronx boy, battle boy, or beat boy? But hip-hop and the parties continue to grow. Going to a Cool Herc party or anywhere playing the top records is where you showed your skills. One of the first big breaking crews was the Mighty Zulu King, started by Africa Bambata. That original crew had about 13 members. One of those very first dancers from the early days went by the name Alien Ness. As hip-hop and breakdancing grew going into the 80s, so did competition, as everyone wanted to see who was the best. In an interview with the Red Bull BC1 Breakdancing Channel, Alien Ness explains how places like Poe Park in the Bronx were the battleground for the best breakers in the area. Every building had its own top b-boy or b-girl, and when they walked into a park, they made their presence known. Places like Poe Park were not only central locations for breaking battles, but also for hip-hop showcases. But now, Many people were coming to the parties and parks to watch the breaking as much as they were there to hear the MC and the DJ. Battles were where you showed your true skill and dominance. It was one thing to be able to perform certain breaking moves, but battles required adapting and improvising in different surroundings and intense environments. And hip-hop continued to grow. In 1980, Curtis Blow released the song The Breaks, which was a tribute to the breakers from the South Bronx and Harlem during the early days of hip hop. The top breakers from the Bronx eventually wanted to expand their horizons and take on other challengers. That meant going into Brooklyn, Queens, and Manhattan. But now, in the early 80s, hip hop and breaking was spreading beyond just the five boroughs of New York. It was quickly spreading through the country and all the way to the West Coast. West Coast hip hop has its own sound and feel to it, making use of funk and disco music, along with futuristic sounds, which would soon evolve into the sound known as gangster rap. But when it came to breaking, a huge scene started to emerge out West. The B-boys and B-girls of LA incorporated their own style into breaking. In New York, there was a big focus on floor work. In the West Coast, dancers spent more time up rocking along with poppin' and lockin', which includes hard hitting movements set to the beat of the music, along with freezing one move for a moment before continuing on with it. Some of the big names in breaking on the West Coast include Shabadoo, Boogaloo Shrimp, and a young Tracy Marrow, who the world would come to know as Ice T. One of the big crews to come out of the West Coast scene was the Electric Boogaloos from Long Beach, California. The Electric Boogaloos featured dancers like Boogaloo Sam and Pop and Pete. Their name comes from the Boogaloo dance, which was also made popular by the performer that had a huge influence on all things hip hop, James Brown. It features robotic movements and soulful steps that would form the foundation of pop and style dancing. The Electric Boogaloos helped to create and develop the moves associated with poppin' and created their own breaking style, which also included unique footwork. Remember that for a bit later on. In 1981, back in New York, as Rapture by Blondie was dominating the airwaves, a new group was dominating the breaking scene, the Rock Steady Crew. Also formed in the Bronx, the Rocksteady crew was a breaking collective, but also dabbled in recording. 
the Rocksteady crew made a major impact on the breaking scene in New York. And in 1982, Africa Bambata acknowledged their skill. The crew earned his respect, and he allowed them to join the Zulu Nation. The Rocksteady crew was like the second generation of breaking. More of the Puerto Rican kids in the Bronx picked up the art of breaking and helped take it to even higher levels. The new era of dancers incorporated even more impressive footwork, head spinning, air moves, and even more acrobatics. The moves and spins became even quicker and the use of cardboard or linoleum soon became part of the cipher to help dancers with their moves and spin even more. This new era of breaking is the one that's seen as bridging the gap between the original breakers and the breaking we see to this day. One of the most notable early members of the Rocksteady crew and legends in the world of breaking is Richard Colon, better known as Crazy Legs. Crazy Legs began breaking when he was about 10 years old while witnessing the birth of hip hop. And Crazy Legs loved to dance. In an as told to essay based on a conversation with him, Crazy Legs explains that he got the name after the captain of his school's cheerleading squad saw him practicing his dancing for a production of Grease and said, quote, oh, he's got some crazy legs. And the name stuck. Crazy Legs really gravitated towards breaking and the competition side of battling other top b-boys. And in 1981, became the president of the Rocksteady crew. But he took breaking to a new level by incorporating incredible moves like head spins and windmills, moves that would eventually be copied and spread around the world. Crazy Legs may also be considered one of the first big breakout stars from the world of breaking and an original hip-hop celebrity. He is still one of the most famous names in the history of breaking. And Crazy Legs was there before hip-hop was even hip-hop. He would also become a key part of a mainstream feature film that helped to further share breaking with the entire world. In 1983, the movie Flashdance was released. This is the story of Alex Owens, a steelworker and dancer from Pittsburgh. But Alex has loftier goals, and her dream is to get into a real dance company. Flashdance is one of those defining 1980s movies that had a big influence on pop culture. The over-the-shoulder, colorless sweatshirt worn by Jennifer Beals became a huge fashion trend as did the look of leg warmers. Flashdance brought us some era-defining songs such as Flashdance, What a Feeling, and the song Maniac. What a Feeling even won the Academy Award for Best Original Song. The soundtrack went on to sell millions of copies, and the movie itself was a massive hit, bringing in over $200 million. That's over $620 million in today's money. Flashdance was a phenomenon, and a lot of people saw this movie. They also got to see a new style of dance many had never seen before. One notable scene in Flashdance involves Alex and a friend walking down the street where they encounter a group of dancers breaking to It's Just Begun by the Jimmy Castor Bunch. A group of onlookers soon gathers around to watch the dancing and the moves that were quite extraordinary. In a movie all about dancing, the 90-second long scene featuring breaking was one of the highlights of the film. People started going to see Flashdance just to see the breaking scene, and Flashdance helped to further bring breaking to the forefront. Those on-screen b-boys were members of the real-life rock steady crew including Norm Ski, Mr. Freeze, Frosty Freeze, Prince Ken Swift, and Crazy Legs, who was only about 16 years old at the time. And in the iconic final dance sequence of the movie set to What a Feeling, Alex even includes an amazing breaking move 
called a whip backspin. That famous final dance sequence was performed by a few different people. There was Jennifer Beals, a body double dancer, a gymnast, and possibly the fact of this entire podcast, the whip backspin breakdance move was actually performed by Crazy Legs. Because no one else could pull off the move, Crazy Legs ended up dressing like Beale's character to perform in that final sequence. Breaking was officially spreading into the mainstream. After its appearance in Flashdance, members of the Rock Steady crew appeared on Late Night with David Letterman. In 1983, Ken Swift and Crazy Legs performed a full two-minute segment, including Crazy Legs performing the same backspin move everyone had seen in Flashdance. The two of them even got to sit down with Letterman to talk about the origins of breaking and how they developed their own original styles. The two also state how they were the best in the city and didn't even really compete anymore because they were now doing many shows and had a lot of new opportunities. Their incredible skills were now taking them out of the country to places like London and Paris. Also in 1983, the Rocksteady crew released the song Hey You. If you grew up in the UK back then, you may remember this song hitting the top 10. Members of the Rocksteady crew came and went, but the group helped to bring breaking to a much wider audience. During this time, many of the breaking crews were made up of B-boys, but the B-girls were definitely making their mark and also having a major impact on the world of breaking. One notable B-girl is Daisy Castro Kudajar, better known as Hero Baby Love. From the Upper West Side in New York, Baby Love was part of the legendary Rock Steady crew. She was also the only female member for about three years. In the male-dominated scene, it was B-girls like Baby Love who helped pave the way for other B-girls and was a huge inspiration on many up-and-coming dancers, showing them that B-girls were an important part of the scene. Baby Love also sang on the rock steady single, Hey You. Another pioneering B-girl is Lane Davey, known as B-girl Lane Ski. Originally from Seattle and an elite gymnast, Lane Ski could pull off moves that other dancers just couldn't. In 1985, she became part of the New York group The Majestic Rockers and is important in the history of breaking as she was one of the first B-girls who mastered and helped to develop many breaking moves from the early 80s. Lansky was a truly dominant B-girl with no fear, battled the B-boys, and craved the competition. In an interview with the Seattle Times, Lansky shares how back in Seattle, she attended all-ages dance parties put on by radio stations. There were times when she entered the circle and busted out her power moves, which caused the other dancers to just leave and start up somewhere else. Then there is Anna Garcia, better known as Rockefeller, an influential dancer for a new generation of B-girls and B-boys. Rockefeller grew up in the 70s and 80s, and I reached out to ask her about her journey. Rockefeller told me that, quote, as a child observing the vibes as they emerged in East Harlem and the Bronx, As a spectator, I grew eager to participate as my older brother brought the music to our Afro-Taino Puerto Rican home. When I finally got the chance to dance, break-in was already fading in the clubs and parties. I kept dancing until I ran into the breakdance again as an older teen and then committed fully when I was 22, unquote. Since then, Rockefeller became a B-girl phenomenon and traveled the world as an ambassador for B-girls. Even though not from the original generation, Rockefeller says, quote, I am proud of my work and do many styles of dance. I am a proud descendant and ascendant of street and club dance in New York City, unquote. Today, Rockefeller is a vocalist 
professor, choreographer, writer, and has worked with the Smithsonian as a guest lecturer on hip hop. Rockefeller, the incredible artist and pioneer, was also in Lin Manuel Miranda's movie In the Heights and also appeared in the video for the legendary song Step Into a World by KRS One. B Girl Crews also made their mark on the world of breaking. The Lady Rockers and the Female Break Force helped pioneer the world of breaking, and all of these incredible B Girls helped influence future generations. In 1983, yet more exposure to breaking came in the form of a documentary called Style Wars. Directed by Tony Silver, the documentary examined hip hop culture and was included in several film festivals and even aired on PBS. Style Wars is mainly about the subject of graffiti, but includes rapping and breaking. But then, also in 1983, came Wild Style a true hip-hop motion picture. Production on Wild Style began way back in 1981 and is about a graffiti artist named Zorro. The film features several appearances from the world of hip-hop, including Grandmaster Flash, Fab Five Freddy, Patty Astor, and the Rocksteady Crew. 1983 is one of the biggest years for hip-hop and breaking, and the whole genre only continued to grow. In 83, the Rock Steady crew performed in front of the Queen of England at the Royal Variety Performance, even getting to meet Queen Elizabeth. Also in 1983, a documentary about West Coast hip-hop and breaking was released called Breakin' and Entrant, which featured the LA breaking scene and their unique approach to the art form. That documentary also features some of those big names like Ice-T and Boogaloo Shrimp. And also in 1983, something unique happened. As West Coast dancers introduced the mechanized style of movement called poppin', it was beginning to influence other dancers and performers. Earlier, I mentioned the electric boogaloos, and not only were they using poppin' dance movements, but also made use of cartoonish type walks, including something that, at the time, was called levitating, or a backslide. The move that involves sliding backwards makes it look like you're moving forward, and it had been around for years. The Electric Boogaloos had been performing the move since the 1970s, and the backslide appeared on shows like Soul Train. Soon, the whole world would know this move as something different. On May 16, 1983, a television special aired on NBC called Motown 25, Yesterday, Today, Forever. One of the performers on the show celebrating Motown was already a huge star, and during his performance, incorporated what looked like a backslide to the astonishment of the audience you would know this move better as the moonwalk. During his performance of Billie Jean, Michael Jackson showed off the backslide to a huge television audience that had never seen anything like it before. The moonwalk, as it was now known, became a phenomenon and had now been broadcast to a mainstream audience. But it was previous breakers that helped pave the way for the moonwalk, including Jeffrey Daniel from the group Shalimar. If you grew up in the UK in the early 80s, you may remember Daniel performing what is now known as the Moonwalk on an episode of Top of the Pops, a full year before Michael Jackson did it. Jeffrey Daniel was also instrumental in helping to bring poppin', lockin', and street dancing to the UK. But from Marty McFly moonwalking in Back to the Future Part 3 to me trying to do it every recess on the school playground, the moonwalk took the world by storm. By 1984, thanks to a group from Hollis, Queens named Run DMC, hip-hop itself was growing like wildfire. Run DMC released their self-titled album in 84, followed by the album The King of Rock in 85, 
then the seminal Raising Hell in 1986. The first album went gold, the second platinum, and Raising Hell went triple platinum while also going platinum here in Canada. Run DMC helped push hip-hop to levels never before imagined. A May 1985 Jet Magazine article said, quote, Just when you thought all music was starting to sound alike, along came the hip-hop sound of New York, thrusting the art of rapping into the limelight. It promises to be the most popular music form since rock and roll, unquote. And through all this, Breaking also continued to grow. 1984 saw the release of the movie Breakin, a breaking-themed musical about a classically trained jazz dancer named Kelly who joins a breaking crew. The movie was released in May 1984 and was influenced by the L.A. breaking scene featured in the Breaking and Entering documentary. The feature film starts some of those b-boys from L.A., including Ice-T. Breakin' was a surprise hit and outgrossed Police Academy, Romancing the Stone, and 16 Candles at the box office. According to Box Office Mojo, Breakin' took in over $38 million, and for the month of May, the only movie that grossed more money than it was Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. This was the power of Breaking in the 80s. The success of the Breakin' movie led to Breakin' 2 Electric Boogaloo. Though not as successful as the original, the sequel, which came out near the end of 1984, still made back three times its budget. Also released in 1984 was the movie Beat Street, one of the best films about the breaking scene. Set in the South Bronx, Beat Street is a dance drama about a pair of brothers coming up in the world of early hip-hop culture, and they're devoted to things like DJing and breaking. Inspired by Wildstyle and produced by Harry Belafonte, Beat Street features several battles, including some between the New York City Breakers and the legendary Rock Steady crew. Breaking just continued to be a big part of popular culture in the 1980s. In 1985, a clip of Prince Charles breaking with a b-boy crew at the Prince's Trust charity was shown on the news. How is he? Well, let's just say that members of the Rock Steady crew didn't have to worry about losing a spot to the future king. But if you've watched the Netflix series The Crown, you saw this moment captured by Dominic West, who played Prince Charles, in Season 5, Episode 5, called The Way Ahead. Growing up in the 80s, my older cousins in England breakdanced. They lived in a little seaside town, and breaking had reached them. I don't know if they were actually any good, but as a younger cousin, I was completely in awe of what they were doing. I was fascinated with hip-hop and breaking, and there it was, happening right in front of me. This amazing form of dance, with its humble origins, became something much bigger than most people could have ever imagined. Hip-hop was a way to verbally express yourself. Breaking was the physical way. This episode just barely scratches the surface of how deep the incredible history, legacy, and performers from the world of hip-hop and breaking go. In the 80s, names like Mr. Wave, Jazzy Jess, Mr. Wiggles, and Tony Touch all inspired generations of new dancers. In his 2019 interview with Vice, Bronx photographer Ricky Flores said about hip-hop and breaking that, quote, it's a story about art and human beings' resilience and their ability to use art as a tool to rebuild themselves and create beautiful things out of tragic situations, unquote. Through the 70s and into the 80s, the Bronx was going through a period of extreme urban decay. For people who lived there, the neighborhood was burning around them. But out of this, a new culture emerged. 
Hip-hop and breaking are synonymous with one another, and both art forms that emerged in the Bronx eventually spread around the globe. Over the decades, I'm not sure exactly how many countries breaking spread to, but it seems to be a large majority of them. At the 2023 World Breaking Championships, B-boys and B-girls from around the world came to compete. Just some of the countries represented included Algeria, Botswana, Denmark, Ecuador, Slovenia, Mongolia, and Latvia. In all, over 60 different countries were represented. And now, breaking is an official Olympic sport to be included in the 2024 Paris Summer Olympics. It's amazing to see the art form from the Bronx go through this amazing evolution to all corners of the globe. From underground to mainstream to worldwide, breaking is a truly global language as it brings together people from a vast array of countries and cultures, all bonded together by this incredible art form. So that's our show. Thank you so much for listening. And if you like what you heard, there's plenty more where that came from in my earlier episodes. So be sure to dive back into those. There are a ton of great topics to keep you covered. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss out on new episodes. If you're in a position to help support the show, you can consider becoming a part of Patreon.com. That's the place to get access to bonus 1980s audio content, including things like the Everything 80s Movie Review Podcast. And if you want to find out more about that, you can just head on over to Patreon.com slash 80s. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash 80s or click on the link in the description. So that's it for me. Again, thank you so much for listening. I'm Jamie. This has been Everything 80s, but I'll be back soon with a new episode. Don't you dare miss it.